I loved it, the service. I, I really loved it. I would have never left the service had I not gotten married. Oh, okay. You know, I signed up four times mm -hmm. to stay overseas. Mm -hmm. So you have to accept what you're given in life to what uh, uh, you can be, you know. And we never talked about the war, never, for 50, 55 years. Mm -hmm. And like I told you, I know why. All right, so we're here with Henry Breeden of Augusta, Maine, and you were born in Augusta. True. Um, what year was that? 25-ish? 1925. 1925. And uh, what do you remember back of that time of growing up in the Depression? Did you guys know it was the Depression? <laughs> oh, I remember all the way back to 1928. To 28, yeah. What was that like in this area, in, uh, in the Depression well, years? Well, we lived in a, uh, a house in the attic of a house. And the owner lived the other two floors below. And it had in the uh, great yard, but it was a slaughterhouse, animal slaughterhouse. So as a kid, I remember riding the pigs, horseback on pigs and sheeps and that kind of stuff that people would bring in hmm. and they slaughter them there. Yeah, so uh, it wasn't a nice place to be raised as a kid. And did your folks work there? Or? No, no. Uh, or you just lived there? They just lived there temporarily. We couldn't find a, a house. Uh, we had too many kids. Uh, there was six kids. Six kids. Six, seven, because this, the last one was born there. Okay. Was born in that at house. The, at the slaughterhouse. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So there was a family of nine living in an attic. Wow. 1928. 1929, we move up on Sand Hill over here, which is... Uh, uh, French section of, of Augusta, mostly people, you know, migrating from Canada and come down and work in the shoe shops and mills and cotton mills and that kind of stuff, which we had here. So that's how the migration started in this section, which was Irish before, suddenly became uh, French-Canadian. And they were making more money here than in Canada, so they used to come down and work, and then they established route and stayed here. They didn't know how to talk English, but we did have everything as a French-Canadian. We did have everything. We had, uh, you know, grocery stores. We had shoe stores. We had, uh, you know, everything you can think of uh, as a city. We had it in the first session because we were not accepted by the Irish, which had the... Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so hmm. uh, slowly, you know, in the 30s, it started to change a little bit. Uh, they started, ex we had our own school system and we only learned French, we didn't learn English. But in the 30s, we finally uh, they allow two hours a day of English. The rest of it, the uh, schooling was, uh, well, we had 10 hours of schooling in the 30, a day, five days a week. Wow, those were long days. Yeah. Yeah, we went to 7 a.m. in the morning, and school did not end before 4.30 at night. So actually, in the winter, you went in darkness, and you came out in darkness out of school. <laughs> the daylight went by. <laughs> it was uh, the time I went to school. Yeah, that was different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hadn't heard that before, that there were 10-hour days. That's a, that's Ten a long hour day. days. Yeah. But it was uh, not accepted by the city uh, because we didn't teach English. So it was known as a convent. You know, it was by the nun 
the oh. parishes was running, uh, so uh, the parish was supporting the school, and they were supplying the teachers, which were nuns, and uh, some were tough, just as tough as men. <laughs> you know, we used to call one teacher the, the Iron Hand because she could slap you pretty hard. <laughs> So you had, I know you said you had some older brothers. Yes, I had, um, um, the older brothers were, uh, you know, the one was the first draftee out of our, out of Maine, number 158, I remember that. I was 16 years old then. And, uh, uh, What year was that? 1941. 41, so after the war was officially started. Yeah. He was first drafted. So he had uh, sleeping sickness we attracted, and he used to walk sleeping. So he'd go to work, he'd come out of work, he'd be sleeping going home, he'd be walked that two, three miles to get home. Uh, not everybody had cars in those days, you know, during the Depression there in the 30s. Uh, Very rarely, uh, in the French section, that they had their own car. Hmm. Everybody was walking. People walk, worked in the paper mill, which was across the river. They used to have their own boat, you know, a wooden boat tied up on this side of the river, and they'd go to work. They'd go get in their rowboat, and they'd row across the river to the paper mill. Instead of walking all the way downtown around, making a circle to find a bridge to go across the river. They go right across above the dam, so, you know, the bridge was way, way down. So they have their own boat and they go to work and come back. And <laughs> once in a while, one would go over the dam and drown. Oh, wow. You know, so it was pretty common. They had to be rough in the winter. Yeah. It was cold. They used to bring, bring down the the wood, the pulp wood, uh, down by the river, you know, that river, down the river. They chopped that up mm, 100 miles from here up to northern Maine, they chopped the wood and just throw them in the river and they come all the way down here. Hmm. Or the mill, uh, they had mill in each town, you know, uh, following the river. They did take their share. Wow. And they made, they, they made paper. Now this is all gone now. So it did started to disappear when I started to, after the war. Uh, the mill, they moved down south, the cotton mill, and the paper mill slowed down to half production and then they, they just closed. Now they're all gone. Shoe shop, we had a lot of shoe shop, same thing happened. You know, I gotta remember, I came out of a very poor family. Mm -hmm. We had nothing. Uh, we had hand-me-down clothing that didn't fit. The government passed the, uh, the law in 1941. If you were 16, you could go to work legally. I had gotten my Social Security card in 1937. Uh, my father was manager of a hardware store on downtown section. So I used to go out of school. Uh, we were getting out at around quarter four, three thirty, quarter four. And I'd walk all the way downtown. And I'd go up into the hardware store take the elevator, go up in the attic, and I'd be putting those little tricycles together mm -hmm. and little red wagon, put them together and they'd bring them downstairs and uh, they would sell them. That was your job while you were in high school? That was my spare time job and uh, on Saturday I used to tend to the owner's garden at the lake, he lived at the lake. So. 
my father would take me up there and leave me there for the day and I'd tend the gardens and weed it out. Uh, I get uh, 50 cents a day. That was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So at 6 o'clock at night, I come back down from the attic and they close the store and my father and I would drive home. I'd have my supper, do my homework, go to bed. That was our life. Uh, in 1941, they passed it. At 16, you could go to work. So I was in the eighth grade. My mother says, I think you're going to have to leave school and you go to work. Uh, we owed a grocery man $900 that we did during the Depression for food. She said, I want to clear that bill before you go in the service you turn 18. So we did. I was working 51 hours a week. Where at? Uh, at the cotton mill. At the cotton mill, okay. And I was making $29.40 whole. After taxes and everything, I was getting, bringing home $23. My mother would give me $5 for my week, and she'd keep the $18 for, to pay for the to go towards that grocery bill. Yeah, and we paid it in two years. She went to work on the second shift. And after having seven children, and we cleared the bill. So we had a, a hard time during the Depression. And uh, most of the family, they all got married, the children got married. So the one that not married were in the service. So there was only number six was me, and I was too young. And then my kid brother, which was three and a half years younger than I was. So my mother could see the end. That's why she wanted that cleared. So coming from the Depression, going into the Army was a good thing for you then? Yeah. We, we either get married or go in. The oldest one, he didn't get married. So he left for the, what we used to call CC camp. Oh, yeah. Uh, was it was a government program. Mm -hmm. They worked the streets and all that, you know, as a group. So did your brother was in CCC, did he travel the country, or was there work around here for him under that? No, he was working on a program right here. Right here. You know, in a 20-mile radius. Okay. You know, there were different towns. Mm-hmm. But they work as a group, you know, like an army, mm -hmm. like an army group. They all work together. They didn't work separately yeah. or for other people. They, they did the work themselves. They work on a road crew. They were all from the same place. You know, they had supervisors. You know. They were underneath that program. They get paid. They, they got paid, at least. Yeah. It's something, you know. Sure. Yeah. And uh, it relieved their family. So. Yeah, they had to stay in the camp then when they were working. Right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, they stayed, uh, you know, the old soldiers' barracks at Togus over here, so. Oh. And I turned 18, I enlisted right off. Now, was it at the mill where you lost the finger? Yep. You lost the mill with the finger. Got caught in equipment, or? Well, I had a friend of mine was working in uh, one one of the depart another department, not mine. And uh, on uh, Friday night we used to go bowling, and I hit the rail with my finger here, bowling. And I said, I wish that finger wouldn't be there. It wasn't there the next morning. Coincident? I don't know. But that's what happened. I got caught helping him 
the same guy I was bowling with. He said, give me a hand to put this roll, 600-pound roll, on a roll on a steel bars and a notch where the pin would go in for the roll. And they they go in into a machine and it cleans the clot. Well, I got caught. He let go of his end. I, I, had, a, I had my end and... And my hand got caught underneath between the pin and the stand. Oh. So I was waiting till the roll went down into the notch. And my hand will go in there first. I pulled, but it didn't pull fast enough. Uh. It caught the end of it. So I crushed it. Oh. They couldn't put it back. So they sold it. So that, that came back again when you went to sign up. They didn't like that. <laughs> well, know, they so said, they no, like we can't up. take you. You can. Your trigger finger is gone. I'm not going to be known as a full ref. There's got to be a place for me. Of course, some of them didn't want to go. And you wanted to go because your brothers had already gone. Yeah. You had one that had gone to North Africa. Is that right? Yeah. They were already there. Yeah. One was in Hawaii. Oh, I wanted to go. So you wanted to go, and they told you no, but you were persistent. Yeah. Yeah, I said, uh, eh, the uh, the Navy refused me. And, uh, every, I tried everybody. No. No, I can't use you. Go work at uh, Bataille and work. I should have gone to Bataille and work. They were paying big money. You know. My brother was already working there. My father was working there. Oh, they both were in the uh, in the shipyard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to go. Destiny, you never know because I went. A stipulation: I was a Class Two B volunteer, which I cannot be sent overseas as a replacement. I could go overseas if my whole outfit goes. But me as a replacement, I could not, they could not do that. So that eliminated me from uh, the infantry. Okay. So, so they sent me to Fort, Desen, uh, Fort Devon in Massachusetts, and they said, well, we don't know what to do with you. So we'll, uh, we'll get some tests to see what we can use you. And they sent me on a tell, on a tell that I did dash and dash. They said, write down what you hear. I wrote it down, all right. He, he said, this guy's got a 98. He, he's sharp. 98 score. Out of 100? On did dot and dash, I could tell the difference. They said, this guy is bound for the single core. They sent me to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. When I got there, they said, well, this is a school place. You got to go to school. So we we did basic training first, and then they assigned you for, to learn to, what you're going to do in the service. Well, I said, well, I love to cook. We'll send you to cook school. <laughs> they sent me to cook school. I couldn't lift those big pots. Uh, one way to get out of one thing is drop it. I drop one. Six to gallon pot. They're that high and uh, that big on the stove. Full of peas. Well, that makes a nice flooring. <laughs> they said, oh, this guy is done. I want to weigh 105 pounds. <laughs> I was small. So. So how long were you in New Jersey then? They said, well, this is a school over here. They have everything. Officers training school. They have, uh, they have all the schools you can take up for the service. So I see us. I see us. They, they posted on a bulletin board. Truck driver school. Ooh, I'll put my name on. They sent me right away to driver school. I went six months. 
to truck driving school. You're ready. So when my outfit left for overseas, you're with it. I was driving, driving the captain around. I mean, what, what the hell? That's a good job. What division were you in then? 15th Division. The 15th. I got the picture downstairs. Yeah. 15th Division. But I had gone to cook school, so uh, during the night, I'd sometime I'd get up at 2 a.m. and I'd go. The bakers would bake during the night. So I love to learn that. So I used to go to with the bakers and I'd talk with them and help them out. And I'd learn how to bake. I came out of there, I was a graduate cook. <laughs> I didn't have the papers, but I could do that. You could do it, that's right. Yeah. I was anxious to learn, that's all. Learn anything I can get. Yeah. It was uh, quite a career. I became tough. And... Uh, I loved it, the service. I, I really loved it. I would have never left the service had I not gotten married. Oh, okay. You know, I signed up four times mm -hmm. to stay overseas. Hmm. So you went to New Jersey, and you had friends you, that you grew up with that also said went in Army at the same time. Yeah. Out of the seven of us uh, that went in on the same street, seven kids we all on the grew same up street. together. Wow. We only lost two. One they never found. In Belgium. The yeah. One in, in the Auckland other one, or? we found him and brought his body back here. Okay. But he's still listed over there okay. in the corner cross okay. because he was buried there. But his mother wanted his remains. Uh, so he's also buried here. Have you written down any about the bulge and all your time after that? I know a lot of people. No, like because, to know more about you know, experience. for 50, 50, 60 years, I was joking around the cellar. But I never tied the cellar to the massacre of Malmedy. I never tied it together. You didn't? They did. The, 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 the history bug, bug uh, in Europe, they get together and they want to recreate the whole system. And they're the one that told me, your outfit got eliminated that day. That was after you'd been reassigned to the 106th? Yeah. So we didn't know. We never talked about the war. Never. For 50, 55 years. Mm -hmm. And like I told you, I know why. And uh, I know why it, it's got into now. It's, it's worldwide now. I mean, this is wide open. I mean, in France or Belgium or Germany or not. They do not forget the Second World War. They do not forget it. It's as just as fresh today as it was 75 years ago. Uh, because they were all affected. My wife was telling me the five years of occupation, five years that she was hid from the German so that the German it cost her father every money, all the money he had, and he had a lot of money. If he wouldn't have had a lot of money, she would have been working in Germany because they were gathering all the young they, people. They seized his factory, you said, right? He had a factory Yeah. to make shotguns. Oh, yeah. If you didn't want to work for them, they seized everything. They strip him. They strip everything. They were collecting in the home, the regular home, they're collecting candelabra or anything they made out of brass or copper. I don't know, they're collecting that. They're running out. They couldn't make bullets anymore. 
the German. You know, they were open on our front. The Russian on one side and us on the other side. It just couldn't sustain it. And her family lived in Liege. Huh? And her family lived in Liege. So they were occupied for five yeah. years. So, you know, it's... And, and a lot of these people living in these conditions, like in basement, they used to uh, put a hole in the basement cement wall to go through to another building. And the other building would do the same. Because those buildings are just like in New York City, they all built together. You know, there's no yard in between. So the vestibule, like you can go in, it's a vestibule. Mm -hmm. so, but the basement is straight through. So when bomb come down, you get out on the other one. Otherwise the you couldn't get out. Yes. So they slept in basement for five years, you know. So, uh, they said if the American would ever been occupied by another country, they would know what war is all about and they wouldn't be about to step into another one. But they don't know in America. They never been bombed, they never slept in a basement for years and eat potato peels. You don't throw away anything that you can, that's edible because you starve to death to start with. Mm -hmm. So you have to accept what you're given in life to what uh, uh, you can be, you know. And, uh, my life is enjoyable now. Uh, uh, you know, I, I could travel every day. I mean, I could uh, calls. This thing don't stop. <laughs> So you're a championship pool player. You golfed with Arnold Palmer. Yeah. And you drove a bunch of actors and actresses around Belgium. <laughs> I've had a good life. Yeah. For a little boy that came out of the Depression, you know, yeah. I consider myself very lucky. You know, I'm pictured with world champion all over. I've got him downstairs in my pool room. And... Uh, uh, you know, I travel with uh, with Willie Hop, uh, Willie Moscone. I was on television with him playing <laughs> matches in Philadelphia. You know, I was in his entourage when he was playing with Minnesota Fat. They ran a series on TV. I used to be one of the 12 guys that were with him. We'd go down, you know, and just play around with him. He came here for vacation, him and his wife, uh, Willie Moscone, 15-time world champion, the greatest pool player that ever lived. And I'm hobnobbing with him. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And now I'm shaking hands with president in France. Two, two presidents over there, president yeah. of France, president of the United States. Yeah, and then and then I had in the seventieth anniversary I had Obama. Yeah. And what was the other one? President of France at that I time. I don't remember who was the French president. Yeah, it's a ago. long name. Well. And then in Belgium, you said you were a driver. For you, for uh, someone who was a son of Captain of 20th yeah, Century and, Fox. His father was vice president of uh, 20th Century Fox uh, movie studio. So you got Bob Hope and uh, I got a, and that's nothing. I returned to Palm Springs and I go see Brown Bob Hope. He has a place right up next to, well, I'm down at the bottom, he's at the top. <laughs> we can't go up his road, because he has a fence there. And he's controlled it upstairs, up there by electronically. So you can talk at the fence, but he, he'll open it if he wants to. So 
a friend of mine from over here, well, was one afternoon, we're looking at at uh, Bob Hope place, you know, out there. We're down the bottom. He said, you know we can climb that? It's all brushes, you know, no higher than that. And we start up there, and we get up there. I got my picture with him and Francis Lamford. <laughs> I said, I'm prepared. If they told me out. Well, we never got the barbell. The guards up there got us when we got to the tip. <laughs> they let us go down the road. Yeah. <laughs> Not the bank. So, who has a tournament? Frank Sinatra has a tournament out there, golf tournament, and they want 400 volunteers. So I volunteer to work the tournament. Who's golfing that tournament? Bob Hope. <laughs> and I have a picture with Francis Lanford. I finally got to him, and I showed him that. Oh, well, he was really interested with the truth. Now I had his attention. I said, I was there when you came there. He said, I don't, I saw so many. I don't remember faces because he said, you don't, you see too many. Right. He says, when you look at the troop, you don't even see their faces. They were all there. There's thousands of them, you know. So, oh, I said, but I remember you. <laughs> I said, said, how did you see me? I said, I saw you because you visited my captain and I was his driver. So I was right with him. And I said, you visited him, not with the troop, but before. Well, he said, I know him well. He said, I know him well. He says, uh, yes, they had connection, he says, with the uh, 20th Century Fox. I said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So he remembered. Uh, you know, he was very intelligent. And uh, I got to visit him at his place afterward. You did? So you did yes. get through the gate finally? <laughs> I did, but it, it took, uh, it was the following year, I think. And I saw him again, and I said, I tried to. I did tell him at that time. I tried to go up to your place up the bank, and I said, but. The guys, they stopped me. He says, well, you want to come up? I says, well, I'd love to see your place. I says, I got my own place. I said, it's down, the, I am at the, on the freeway. I said, uh, well, I said, but I said, I ride behind you. I said, I, I see you like I, I'm looking at a mirror. There's no instruction. You're right up on the top. So he gave me a piece of paper. He said, here, call at the gate. You want to come up? And he said, if I can, I will see you. And I did. And I, I brought my wife up with me. Wow. <laughs> and we went up there. We visited with Bob Hope. So, uh, you know, he he was a, a good guy, but he's always joking. So you didn't know when he was serious or not, but he always joking. He had a million of them. It was unbelievable. My life has always been to try to help the other people. I don't have much, but whatever I had, I can share. I was involved in a local program over here in the city. I had a, uh, my brothers were the one that didn't go in the service, was an amateur boxer in the 30s. Sometimes he fought five different opponents per day. He did very well. He collected watches. That's all they gave him, no money. 
he fought over 300 fights. When I went overseas, I was on the John, and that's where you find newspaper. I opened the newspaper that was on the floor. My brother was picture was on there. He was fighting Lloyd Hudson, which was the champion over here. He was the British champion, but he was sent over here for training. And my brother says, I'll fight him. He came out of retirement. My brother was a fighter in the 30s. He was not in the 40s. He was considered an old man. When you're 35, 37 years old, uh, you're an old man. But he went in and he did very well against a uh, uh, world champion. And I picked that up. And I was going overseas on the Ile de France, the third largest ship in the world. I landed in Scotland. Well, when I came back here, we always got involved into something. I got a promoter's license and I started an ABC hmm. at a downtown building there that was uh, vacant. The city gave me that and I had a boxing club. I got the boxing club, ABC, <laughs> amateurs. Well. I had a guy that approached me. He said, uh, you put on uh, amateur boxing. He said, and, uh, I need help. I said, what do you need? He said, my daughter has cerebral palsy. And he says, uh, they are schooling. Uh, in a vacant building. He says, we want to build a home for them where they have a decent place. Uh, we have to raise money. I said, uh, how can we help? Well, he said, you, you put up amateur boxing uh, for service organization, he said, why can't we put it up for cerebral palsy? Well, I don't care. Sure, my boxers will box for that. And we started that ABC clubs, got a promoter's license, and we put on, we got the Civic Center, we put on fights. We raised money for cerebral palsy. We got the building. Wow. But what turned out, we didn't have a boxing ring. We had ropes strung on posts, pipes, that was holding up the building. <laughs> you can't put on professional boxing, people pass people to pay. Uh, you don't have a ring. So we, Started advertising for, let it be known in the crowd, different town, we needed a ring. Well, the Boy Scout of America, 50 miles from here, they get in touch with us. And they said, we have a ring. And it's for sale. Oh. Where's that ring? Well, it's in that town up there. So we go up there and we go look at the ring and it's in there, it's on a barn and there's hay over it and we take the cover off and we look and say, well, it's all dismantled and, well, we said, uh, how much do you want for it? They say $500. So the guy, that, his daughter there, he says, I'll pay for it. Okay, he pays for the ring. We got a pickup truck and we go get it and we load all that up and we got to put it up now. Well, we put up this ring. 
And right away after it was put up, this is a super ring. I mean, we thought it might have been a, an amateur ring, but it's 24 by 24. 24 by 24 is a, is a professional championship ring. It stays that way for a while. And we did four or five fight, and somebody uh, noticed it, the ring. He was on the boxing commission in Maine. So he said, where'd you get that ring? Well, so we bought it off Boy Scout in uh, Rumford. Oh. He says, uh, I know that ring. I said, you do? Why? What, what's the matter with the ring? He says, that's a famous ring. I said, what do you mean it's a famous ring? He says, you remember, he said, in 1959, Sonny Liston had the shortest world champion boxing match, 59 seconds, he knocked his man out. <laughs> I said, yeah, in Lewiston, Maine. Well, he said, that's the ring. Wow. <laughs> they built that ring to put on that world match, and then they gave it to the Boy Scout. And you got it for 500 bucks. <laughs> and we got it for $500. That's a cool story. So I wrote a story <laughs> about that afterward. I said, imagine that. Now, we had this ring. I sold that ring for 5000 Oh, wow. Because <laughs> the guy for the silver palsy, he didn't want it. He was not in the boxing business. So after he got done putting on these shows, he says, give me $500, you're going to have the ring. And I knew at that time what the ring was all about. So, I gave him the $500. I got caught here in the police uh, stakeout for drugs. I took my wife home one night, 9 o'clock. She wasn't my wife, she was my girlfriend then. I took her down the street here and into her neighborhood and they had the neighborhood staked out. And the Cadillac went in. I dropped out the house, I made a U-turn, came back out. They got me on the way out. I said, gee, that Cadillac went in and then came right back out. He made a delivery. <laughs> they held me prisoner for two hours. Hmm. Three police cars. Yeah. I got pissed. Told them to go to hell. I'm going home. They followed me here. I pulled in the yard. They said, don't get out of the car. <laughs> I said, good. I opened the garage door and I drove in the garage. Shoot if you want. They got me in the garage, wouldn't let me out of the car. Huh. Two of them. The other one was on the phone. After about an hour, they said, he came over, he said, sorry, sir, this was all a mistake. They turned around and left. But I wrote the story, and I gave it to the mayor. They came over and apologized. I said, and I told them at the end, I said, the way you treated me, I says, I fought the Gestapo, and that's the same treatment. That the Gestapo, and they reminded me I fought for this. And now it's here. 
So people better watch out. They were not interested in my license. Never asked me for my driver's license. They thought they had a delivery man. They wanted a warrant to open the trunk. Apparently they didn't get it. That's a scary story. <laughs> so it's part of my life. I wrote that story and what happened, I've got it. But it's Watch out, America. Mm -hmm. Can happen to anybody. I understand it was a rookie cop, but nonetheless, it happened. It happened to a citizen. It happened to, uh, he was not given his right. Uh, he was not arrested. He was just held. Mm -hmm. uh, if they put a charge, they're different, you know. Then you can have a lawyer, you can have somebody to talk for you, you can, uh, you can prove who you are, but none of that. It was cloak and dagger. But it can happen here, it can happen anywhere probably, I don't know, but it happened to me. It happened to the wrong guy because I'm going to speak up. I'm not going to let it sleep down and they got, they got their answer. And I said, it, it's not only that, I said, it's now, it's, it might get published one day because it's in with my paper. Mm -hmm. So, the story that happened, I write it. Wow. Yeah. It's a different story, a different life. And today, most people, I cannot tell you, most people my age are even 10 years or 20 years younger in here, uh, they can't accept a new life, uh, the life of uh, you know, computers and cell phone. And we fought against carrying a phone, a phone on vacation. Now it's a pleasure for them. <laughs> We're getting away from the phone. We're going on vacation. <laughs> no phone. That's Jeez. right. <laughs> now, if you don't have a phone, you don't exist. That's right. You don't know what's going on. Nobody's telling you because they're too busy on their phone. That's right. <laughs> if you don't have a phone and join them, you don't own anything. <laughs> it's, it's a different life and Everybody, they can't accept it. Expects we have a you. thousand members in my club. I can tell you that we don't have two dozen people that have cell phones. Two dozen that don't. No, two dozen that have cell phones. Two dozen that do have cell phones. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the only reason that they have it is to look at pictures. Yeah. <laughs> they want Facebook. That's all they talk about. Oh, okay. <laughs> but most of them don't then. Okay. No, they, I'm 94 years old. I'm there with my cell phone. And, you know how to run that? Yeah. You got yours? No, I don't have that. <laughs> you know that. But you're just ahead of the crowd. <laughs> They're just uh, slow to adapt, but you told me you try everything. <laughs> yeah. You got a computer? I said, yeah, I got four. Com Got four computer. Four computer? What do you do with that? I said, that's nothing. You gotta come over and help me. I says, read my messages. Yeah? How many you got? Well, I know on one computer I got 30,000. <laughs> you must be kidding. I said, no, they're only two years old. In the last two years. I said, I eliminated 15,000 before that. <laughs> Why do you keep that? I said, well, it's a library. If I want to know something that happened last year, certain date, 
I just go right back there. I know who called me. Yeah, but that slows down your computer. <clears throat> well, I said, I'm in no hurry. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> that gets them upset. <laughs> They're young kids. And <laughs> they know I'm pulling their ears out. Well, you were talking about Bob Hope, and he was very active with the military, but you told me you've stayed very active, too, with, with things like Honor Flight. Yeah. What all are you doing there? I was an ambassador. Um, I went to first flight. I thought it was, it was fantastic for a veteran to take the trip. And uh, they needed to raise money, so... Uh, I've always been one to uh, do charity work. Mm -hmm. I love to do that. And uh, so I said, I told him, I said, well, I have talent that they will perform for me free. And I said, I think if I put on a show, to raise money, I can fill up the hall. I said, which holds 360. So I said, if we put on a show, at $10 each, that's $3,600. And if I can get donors to pay for the food, the order before the show uh, won't be no cost on my my end, so they're going to be free for three thousand six hundred. So I said, I think I can do it. So they said, Well, if you can do it, that would be fine to raise money for us. So I said, okay, I'll let you know. I said, uh, so I got my club to donate the hall and donate the food. Then I went to see the auto dealers and I told them, I said, I have bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. You donate two hundred and fifty dollars. I said, you can get bronze. What about these? Well, you have to give more, because this guy gave me five hundred dollars, and this guy he gave me a thousand, and this guy gave me two thousand five hundred. He's platinum. I said, no, I'm going to recognize these people on the paper, local paper. Huh. So this guy gave you $500. This dealer? I'll give you a thousand. I pit one against the other. <laughs> you know, they're jealous. And you raised quite a bit of money, you said. Yeah. I opened the door. I had out thirty-one thousand uh, in the till. Oh wow! <laughs> so it started at three thousand six hundred. Yeah. I still got that at the door. <laughs> so I decided to run it two nights. I fill them both up. Hmm. So I did that for three years. They made me an ambassador. Hmm. Oh, I said, I can't do it anymore. It takes too much time. The time, I gotta go see all these people, you know, beg for money, and it's a job. You go there, sometime I went there five times before I could see the, the owner. Well, he's out here, well, he's out in business. Uh, he can't talk to you, he's in conference. Uh, 
you know. The higher they're up, the harder they are to see. Once you see them now, you can help maneuver them, you know, and just suggestion. You don't force them. You say, you know, let them do their own decision, but tell them what they're up against, and you're all set. You're honest with them, they're honest with you. This is, the system has been working very well. So. And from that start, you're up to where you said you take four trips a year this year? Uh, groups, 60 people yeah. at a time? That's a, it's a great 70, program. 70,000 a trip. Okay. 70,000 costs for one trip. Okay. And then you do something really special with those guys in that you bring back the vials of sand from Omaha Beach. Yes. Yeah. Uh, That's really This This really meaningful. caught on. Uh, it was an idea of mine, and it's really caught on. It's, it's, uh, I know this was done as an afterthought, you know, and we got it, why not, you know. So people were getting sand over there, but they were taking it home, not doing nothing with it. But what good is that if it stays there? I ain't gonna do nothing. So give it to people. It means something. They can't go. You know. Can't go. I gave one of my medals, you know, the big one there? Mm -hmm. Cause I got three now. Yeah. I gave one away. Well, they were mad in hell over there at uh they said, You have no right to give those medals to I said, Well, the guy was on the beach. And he's never been. The guy was on the beach at the invasion. He survived. I know it's luck. You don't know when a bullet's going to hit you. I was in there, but 11,000 died and wounded on that day on Omaha Beach, so. I have a picture of the lay down cardboard figure of a soldier on the beach. That beach was covered for miles. They did that. So. If uh, if you weren't there, you can't understand what it means. Well, I've taken up a lot of your day. I better let you go. <laughs> yeah, well, you're a good person, and I... I really enjoyed talking to I you. I don't do that for anybody. I'd love to uh, come back First time I ever have, have uh, I did get an interview for uh, the time we were working in the mill, and they won't open up a something about an exhibition, and they made a disc. They sent me a copy, as a matter of fact. Uh, when I was working in the mill as a kid, what we were earning, you know, and all that, so it's history now. Yeah. You know, that's, that's more than 75 years ago. I was only 16 years old, so. So it's nearly 80 years. <laughs>